Good morning, church family. Happy Easter. He is risen. And you would respond, he is risen indeed. This is an Easter unlike any other, but I think it's an Easter much like that first Easter. The tomb is empty. The churches are empty, but that does not mean that God is not at work. That does not mean that God is not doing something in and through us. So this morning, I want to welcome you. Welcome you, and uh, if you're able, I invite you to stand. We're going to be reading from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. From now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled, to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Let us pray. Holy Father, on this most blessed day, God, help us to exalt you, help us to praise you, help us to bring you all the glory. God, there's no amount of thanks that we can offer you to to pay back what you've done for us. God, sending your son to earth to live as a man, to show us how to live, to, to bring about healing and restoration and reconciliation. And God, then to die on a cross for the forgiveness of our sins, bearing them upon himself. And then God, on the third day, he rose again and ascended and is at your right hand now. Father, we thank you. Lord Jesus, we thank you. And Holy Spirit, we thank you for being poured out on and into us. So God, let everything we do bring you glory. God, help us to remember that it's not just ourselves we represent everywhere we go, but it's you. And so God, give us the presence of mind to move forward for you, building your kingdom here and now. We love you, Lord. In your holy name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand and join us as we sing songs of praise. Well, welcome this morning. We just welcome you to join in worship this morning with us on this Easter Sunday morning. And we just remember the gift of salvation and how Jesus overcame death this this morning. We celebrate that this morning uh, for Easter Sunday, where he paid the price for our sin and paid the price for our salvation. We just thank you for joining with us this morning and invite you to sing along with us. And let's praise the Lord together.
some announcements this morning. Our Bible study is taking place on Wednesdays from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. on Zoom. Uh, We just finished up the the book of Philippians, and and this next Wednesday we're going to dive into the book of James. I invite you to join us there. Uh, If you are a regular attender and I have your email address, I've been sending out those invitations to you. Uh, to join us. Uh, and if you aren't able to join us at that time, you can uh, go to our YouTube page. It's Orofino Nazarene on YouTube. Just search for it and you'll find it there. And uh, the next day I typically will, will post up the, the video showing, uh, showing what we talked about and just kind of, it's a Zoom meeting. So it's recorded. You can watch it. Also, we're, we have life groups going on online. If you'd like to join them, please let me know. You can email me, Orofino Nazarene at gmail.com. And we'll get you plugged into one. It's a great opportunity to, to connect with people even in this time where we have to be socially distant. It's good to see each other's faces and, and just to be with each other and to read God's word and study it. I want to thank all of you for meeting the needs here in our community. Uh, uh, man, 
we have been meeting the needs, uh, helping people get groceries, uh, buying things for people, and, and just encouraging one another and loving on one another. Thank you for doing that. If you know of someone who's in need that you're not able to, to meet that need, again, let me know. We'd love to, to meet those needs for our, our, those, for our families, for our community here in Orofino and wherever it is that God finds us. I also have a thank you this morning uh, coming to you from uh, Wes and Kristen Heckathorn uh, for the food and uh, supplies that were bought for their son in the Middle East uh, to help him uh, through the time that he is there. Um, they wanted to express thank you, so thank you, church family. We, we are here today to worship God, to bring him glory and praise and there's no amount of offering, there's no amount of works, there's no amount of anything that we can do to, to give back to God for what he has so richly given us. Uh, if you would like to give, uh, I invite you to do that. Uh, our, our address is uh, P.O. Box 582, Orofino, Idaho, 83544. Um, but I also want to ask for, for you to be the hands and feet of Christ here in our community and wherever it is that God finds you to reach out, to meet needs, check in on your neighbors, make sure they're doing okay. Uh, be the hands and feet of Christ right where you are. And so if money's tight, don't worry about sending in a check, but, but please give of your time and your resources to help those in need around you. Let's pray over the offering this morning. Lord Jesus, Father God, Holy Spirit, we thank you. God, we thank you for all the ways you bless us. We thank you for what today represents for us. And so God, take the offering that we give this morning. Take uh, the, the money that we tithe. And God, help it to build your kingdom here and now. But God, more than that, God, we, we give ourselves as a living sacrifice to you. So God, use us as you will. God, give us the courage to be obedient when you call us to step out in faith and do something. And Father, help us to come alongside the things you're already doing. God, there are many people in need. So God, help us to be your hands and feet to them. Father, we love you. We thank you. Would you take the gifts that we give and multiply them? God, to bring you glory, to show other people who you are. We ask all this in the mighty, resurrected name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing some more songs of praise. Suffering is on to the other. 
Well, good morning, church family. This Easter morning, I'm going to be interviewing Levi Van Brunt, the, the, mini, the mini pastor, the pastor in training. We're going to talk about Easter. You ready to talk about Easter, Levi? Yep. All right. Awesome. So, so tell me, Levi, what are you most excited about on Easter? For Jesus rising up from the dead for three days after Easter, that's the one that probably everyone is, yeah. most of the people in the church is. Mostly. Yeah, yeah. So how do we celebrate Easter? We, um, I don't really know that, but I do know one. We praise to God okay. for on Sunday yeah. for Jesus, right? Right, right. So I have a question for you. Do you know when people used to go to church or the tabernacle, the Jewish people? Do you know what day of the week they did that? Um, probably Sunday, because of we're at Sunday and we still do it. Oh, yeah. No. So do you know, do you know, you ever look at a calendar? Um, yep, I have one right over there. Okay, so what is the seventh day of the week on the calendar? Look at the calendar. What's the seventh day of the week? Saturday. Saturday, that's right. And do you remember in the Old Testament how we got the Ten Commandments about how we were supposed to rest on the seventh day? Mm hmm So Saturday is the seventh day. So they used to go to the tabernacle and worship God on Saturday. All right. But we do it on Sunday now. Do you know why we do it on Sunday? Uh huh. So, because of instead of praying on the past, we can pray on the past and ahead. Because of ahead goes through Sunday, so it would be the same thing to go around. But it would have to kind of, but it would be one day behind. Oh yeah, yeah. Well. <laughs> Can so I it say something? To start at Sunday, right? So it goes through seven, correct? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Well, the reason we go to church on Sunday is because that's the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Easter took place on the first day of the week. Hey, do you remember the book of Genesis in the Bible? Um, yep. What happened on the first day? I do remember Genesis in the Bible, but I don't really know that part. Okay. Well, the first day is when God started creating things, right? Uh-huh. On the first day. And so on Easter Sunday, death no longer wins. Jesus rose from the dead. And so we celebrate being a new creation on Sunday. I mean, actually, I think I've heard about God creating everything. Yeah. At my old, in Kansas at Samuel's church. Yeah. Um, I don't care what it calls. So what do you think is the most important thing about Easter? From Jesus rising up from the dead. Absolutely. Okay, and why is that important? Because of he died on the cross to save our sins, and probably the people don't want to forget forget about him. So, and three days is probably enough for them to have a whole year. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Well, you have given us some really good information today. Thank you, Levi. You're welcome. Hey, would it be okay if I prayed with you? Sure. Okay. Father God, thank you for Levi. Thank you for Samuel. Thank you for all the children, God. God, today we lift them up to you. And God, we thank you that you are the God that, that sees us. You are the God that knows us. And God, you are the God that came to save us. 
And so, God, we thank you for, for, especially on Easter Sunday, God, we thank you for your son, Jesus, for his obedience to you, for his trust in you, and God, for his sacrifice for us, because he loves us, because you love us. And so, God, help us to love you back like you deserve. God, help us to have faith like children. And God, help us to seek your will above all else. God, help us to turn everything over to you and trust you. We love you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for these beautiful children. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Levi, thank you very much, buddy. You're welcome. I'll see you later, okay? All right. All see right, you bye. Next Sunday. See you next Sunday, yes. Bye-bye. We talk about prayer all the time, and just a couple days ago on, on Thursday, we celebrated the, the Last Supper. And then after that, Jesus went out to a garden, asked his disciples to sit and pray, and he went on a little further, and he prayed. And so God, prayer is so important. God, it's hard to share our prayer requests right now, um, but if you have a prayer request you would like to share, you can email it to me, and I would be more than happy to be praying over that. I'm praying for each and every person that, that I have their contact information for, um, and for a lot of people in our community who, who don't attend our church, uh, and for families, and we are called to be a people of prayer. As we find ourselves at home, sitting in some social isolation, away from each other, I want to encourage you to be in prayer often. Spend time with the Father, talking to Him, and then listening to Him as well. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, Father God, thank you. God, thank you for providing for our needs. God, help us, help us to bring everything to you. And God, help us to be in relationship with you, talking and listening all the time. There's a lot of people out there who are scared right now. There's a lot of people who, who are completely cut off. But God, we're never cut off from you. So God, I pray that they would lean into you. And then God, as your hands and feet, I pray that we would be reaching out to them, checking in on them, seeing what it is that they need. Because God, we are your children and we are called to take care of one another. Lord, speak to us. Your children are listening. Give us your wisdom and discernment in the days ahead to follow you with reckless abandon. And Father, for those who are afraid, for those who are living in isolation, we lift them up to you. We pray for your peace, for your grace, for your mercy. And God, most of all, we pray for your will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Father, you are wonderful. And we thank you. We praise you. And God, you, you have done so much for us. And so God, we pray that we would be a blessing poured out from you to the world. Thank you, Lord. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Now we're going to be hearing from my friend Richard Hoffman. He's reading from the New International Version, and this week we are on John chapter 20. Follow along on the screen and listen to him. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, and the one Jesus loved and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. 
both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked up at the stripes, strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separated from the linen. <clears throat> Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying as she wept. She bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go and sit to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After she said this, after he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week Later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Through the door, though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, 
and that by believing you may have life in his name. So Easter is the one Sunday in the church that we tend to be the fullest that we are all year long. It's something that we often spend so much time planning for. And this year we find churches on Easter much like the tomb, empty. But you see, this is an amazing opportunity for us. You see, on this Easter, we find ourselves at home. This Easter, we have the opportunity to reach those who might not normally come to church, even on Easter. So for some of you joining us this morning, you may be asking a couple questions. Maybe right now you're being forced to watch this with your family. Or maybe you're questioning everything right now in the midst of what's going on. So we're going to start this morning with a couple of questions that you might be asking and and answer them. The first is, why does Easter matter? Why is it so, or what is so important about the resurrection? If you're not new to the Bible and Christianity, then this is a story that you know. You have probably heard it time and time and time again. And for others of you, maybe it's lost some of its impact because you've heard it so many times. But you know what? It's the story of Jesus rising from the dead. The story of any person rising from the dead. That's not the kind of thing that happens every day. So maybe it can still hit us. Maybe it can still impact us. You see, I, I think it's the most significant event in all of human history. Because without the resurrection, just what would we be following? Without the resurrection, uh, we would only be following the teachings of a dead man who who was not who he said that he was. And there would be nothing special about the Christian faith if that were true. You see, the resurrection matters because it's the assurance that all of God's promises in and through Jesus Christ are true. If Jesus rose from the dead, just like he said he would, then can we not trust him to keep all the other promises he made to us? You see, he said, if we believed in him, if we trust him, if we follow him, if we obey him, then we will have eternal life. Without the resurrection, how would we know that's true? You see, he promised us that through faith in him, our sins would be forgiven. And that we, and that he would give us the Holy Spirit, and that he would be with us forever through the Holy Spirit. Without the resurrection, we have no way of knowing if those things are true. We could believe on the death of the cross and and hope that it saved us, but we just couldn't know for sure unless he rose from the dead. The resurrection and the ascension establish a new identity for the church for the followers of Jesus. And the ascension is an important part of that. Jesus' resurrection is not a complete story without his ascension into heaven. The story is only complete when the God who descended to earth and took on human flesh also ascends back to heaven to the right hand of the Father. Through him we have a new relationship with God. Jesus says to Mary, tell my brothers I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. In Christ, we have a new identity. We are brothers and sisters of Jesus. We are children of God. We we come before him with the confidence and the security that only children could know. This new relationship is only made possible because of the death, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord Jesus. Through Jesus' death, our our sins are atoned for. Our debts are paid. You see, back in the Old Testament, when someone sinned, that broke their covenantal relationship with God. And, And there had to be a price paid to be put back into relationship with God because God could not bear to be near sin. That normally took the form in some sort of sacrifice, something that cost us something, whether it's the sacrifice of an animal like a lamb or some other resource like wheat. Through that sacrifice, the cost of something it restored our relationship with God. But you see, the problem is is that afterwards we went back out and and what happened? Life happened and we sinned again. So we had to go back and offer another sacrifice. 
But now all of our sins are atoned for, covered by the blood of Christ, washed clean by him. You see, the same spirit that brought Christ back from the dead now lives in us because Christ sent him to us after he ascended. You see, the gospel of John, more so than the other gospels, emphasizes the intimacy between Jesus and the Father. And the gospel closes with the good news that through him, we can have the same intimate relationship with God. The resurrection is the central message for the disciples. And the story is recorded in all four of the gospels. But to say that all four report it is not to say that all four tell it the same way. The gospel of John has a number of differences. And one of those in particular I think is helpful to think about. You see, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all report that some variety of persons went to the tomb early on the first day of the week, on Sunday. Matthew and Luke say that it was at dawn. Mark says that it was very early, but but notes that when the sun had risen. Now, John alone notes that Mary Magdalene went to the tomb while it was still dark. Now, if you're really worried about that sort of thing, you can say that that Mary went before dawn and, and others came later, but I think you would be missing the point. Of all the gospel writers, John is the philosopher. John's gospel is highly symbolic and multi-layered. Just like an onion, multi-layered. It almost never means only what the words on the page say. You see, there are symbolic themes that run throughout it. John's gospel was written much later than the other three. And there are those that say it was meant as kind of a commentary on the other three, that that Matthew, Mark, and Luke will tell you what happened, but John will tell you what it all means. Now, one of the key themes that runs throughout the Gospel of John is the theme of light and dark. It's introduced in the very first paragraph of the Gospel. John 1, 3, 5 says, What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Now, after setting that up in the first paragraph, I don't think it's any accident that we have this light and dark theme appearing here at the end. I don't think that John forgot whether the sun was up or not, and I don't think it's a mere historical rendering of of when Mary showed up at the tomb. You see, when Mark says it's dark, he means you can't see. When John says it's dark, he he means so much more than physical darkness. Now, the last time we we saw Mary Magdalene in John's gospel, she was standing at the foot of the cross as Jesus died. She's there at the cross with Jesus' mother, Jesus' aunt, and John. She's the first one to the tomb and, and the first to see Jesus after his resurrection. You see, she's not on the fringe of Jesus' followers, which means that for Mary, as, as much as for any of Jesus' other disciples, the days had been very, very dark indeed. She was there at the darkest of them. She watched him die horribly, brutally, as a criminal. And, and that's about as dark as it gets in a soul. And when she comes to the tomb on the first day of the week, it's still dark. She's still very deep in the grief and horror, the disbelief of what has happened. You see, the sun could have been shining very brightly. It doesn't matter because for her it was dark, so dark. But John wants to say more than indicating that Mary hasn't had a very good weekend. You see, his theme from the beginning is that Jesus is the light of the world. And no amount of darkness can snuff that out. What he's showing, I think, is how Mary lives out that hope and what happens as a result. What's interesting to me here is is not that one of the Gospels tells us of the actual resurrection. You see, none of them record any blinding flash of light, any earthquakes, any visions, any glowing rocks, nothing of that sort. What they report is the discovery of an empty tomb. Nobody tells about the event itself. Here is this huge, central event, and no one sees it. 
Even though Jesus' birth was ignored by the masses, there were still angels singing to shepherds, signs in the night sky that, that these foreign astrologers, these wise men could read, and a king mad enough about a possible usurper to the throne that he orders a massacre of all these boy children. But nobody gets tipped off about the resurrection in any of the stories. It happened sometime in the night while it was still dark, and nobody knew until Mary went and looked. You see, spiritually, this is our hope. I I don't know about you, but I've had some very dark times in my life. For some of you, you might be in a very dark time right now in this time of social isolation with with COVID-19 and everything going on. But you see, when it's dark, you can't see what's going on around you. There's too much grief, too much pain, too much doubt, too much fear, and that's the time we're tempted to, to give up on God and maybe even our own God-given lives, believing that, that God's not ever going to do anything for us, believing that he doesn't care about what happens to us. Sometimes we just want to pull the covers over our heads and give up. But you see, Mary has something to teach us in those times. She went to the tomb while it was still dark. Despite her grief and fear, Mary got up and she did something. She went to the last place she knew Jesus was. Even though it was his tomb and she knew darn well he was dead, she had watched it. She went anyway. As useless as it was, she needed to be where Jesus was to give her comfort in the dark. And so Mary shows us what faithfulness in the dark looks like. When our prayers seem to just hit the ceiling and fall back down on our own heads, we pray anyway. When reading the Bible is just so many words on a page, we read anyway. When when going to church seems to be just going through the motion with a bunch of hypocrites, we go anyway. We go to the tomb, we go to the place that we last saw him while it's still dark. But you see, and then that time comes when we discover that God has been at work even in the darkness. It wasn't in the papers or in the news. Nobody saw it happen. But things are different. The tomb that we expected to stink with rotting flesh has been swept clean. There's panic. What's happened? Is the other shoe dropping now? Is something worse now adding to our dark misery? And so Mary panicked and she ran and she got Peter and John and they came running back and they saw the empty tomb but then they went back home. But not Mary. She stuck it out. If it's worse, so be it. If they'd stolen the body, she was going to find it. Mary's not afraid of the dark because she is determined that she will find Jesus in it. And in her faithfulness, the the scene again shifts. She goes into the tomb and there's these angels there. She turns around and there's someone else there, this gardener maybe. But then the gardener speaks her name. The light dawns and she can finally see. It's Jesus. He is risen. He is risen. Her tears vanish. Her prayers are answered and she goes out in joy as the the very first evangelist to tell the others the good news. And it all happened to her because she was faithful while it was still dark. No matter how bleak and impossible the situation looks, she went back to be with Jesus. Even when he wasn't there, she stayed because she was unwilling to take his absence as an answer. And Easter dawned. Now, of course, the resurrection had already happened in the night, Uh, But the reality of the resurrection didn't make the slightest difference in Mary's grief until she screwed up the courage to go out into the dark and face whatever was there. Our Christian life is like that. We meet Jesus at some point, some of us earlier, some of us later, and we enjoy life with him. The food he provides, the healing, the teaching, the acceptance of us just as we are. But then there comes a time when it all seems to go up in smoke. We question everything. Our spiritual lives are as dry as the desert. 
Life hits us hard, and Jesus seems dead and helpless. There's no point, we think. It's over. He wasn't who I thought he was. He, he wasn't what I thought he was. He can't save me at all. He couldn't even save himself. And then darkness descends. In those times, though, we, we have to listen to the witness of Mary. So what? He is my Lord, dead or alive. If a tomb is where I have to go to be with him, then that's where I'm going. If, if, if you go and you weep and, and you fear and it's gotten even worse, but then out of the dark, someone calls your name. And you know it. You know that voice. He is alive. The stone is rolled away. The dawn has come. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. It can't overcome it. It never has and it never will. Life and light make the whole world new. But that Easter experience comes from being faithful in the dark. Now Thomas, one of the other disciples, he heard the news, but, but there was still no Easter for him. He didn't believe it. He didn't really believe that the darkness could, could overcome the light. Or he didn't believe that the darkness could be overcome by the light. Easter didn't come for Thomas until a week after when Jesus showed up and allowed him to come in and stick his fingers in Jesus' wounds. And that's why we call him Doubting Thomas. Only then does, P does Thomas acknowledge the reality of Easter. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. And, and what about you? Is it still dark in your life? Dark times come to everyone, even to Jesus. You see, darkness is not a sign that you don't have any faith. Instead, darkness is the opportunity to show your faith, as Mary did. Darkness is the time to, to get up and face those fears head on, to go to the tomb. It's the time to recognize that Easter happened in the dark, when everybody was depressed and, and thought the work of God was a sham. God was doing the most wonderful work of all. So get up, go to the tomb, it's empty. He's alive and if you stick it out, he will speak your name. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. So what about you? Who are you in this story? Are you Peter and John who come running to see and then just go back home without having met Jesus? Are you Thomas who simply refuses to believe the news and so Easter doesn't come for him for another week? Or are you Mary who refuses to let Jesus get away from her and is the, and is the very first to know the joy of Easter morning? God's action was the same for all of them. The resurrection happened and was there for any of them to experience. You see, it wasn't the actions, actions of Jesus that were different. It was the response of his followers that determined whether the joy of Easter came early or it came late. He is alive. He is alive. The darkness has vanished. The stone is rolled away. I used to listen to this pastor a lot, and he had this saying, things may seem dim now, we are full of fear and trembling, but I tell you, Sunday is coming. Well, my friends, Sunday has come. We know the outcome. Christ is risen. He has conquered death, and we are a new creation in him. So how is that knowledge going to affect your life moving forward? What are you going to do about it? Our hope today is in him, in the resurrected and ascended Savior. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. Suffering and 
so thankful that even when things seem dark, even when things seem dim and, and we, we don't know how to get out of the darkness, God, that is when you were most at work. God, your light shines forth and the darkness cannot overcome it. So Father, give us hope. Give us peace. Give us your blessed assurance today. God, help us to celebrate today. <sighs> Death has lost its sting. God, you, you have won. There is no doubt now. So God, give us courage to go out and face the day, even in the midst of everything that's going on, God, because we know that, that this is not the final answer. This is not the last thing. Because God, in you, we are a new creation. And God, we are your children. And you watch over us, our goings and our comings, both now and forevermore. And we thank you. We love you, Lord. In the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrected and ascended King, we pray. Amen. Now go out there and bear all the fruits of the Spirit today and forevermore. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. May the peace of Christ surround you, fill you, and bring you hope. May the love of Jesus Christ penetrate your very being and then pour forth from you. May the hope of Christ be a light shining in you and through you to the world. You are blessed. Now go and be a blessing to others. Go in peace. You are loved.